Okay, so let's uh, let's try this again. This will be lesson number eight, take two. Uh, had a little confusion about the first try, but I think I've got it all sorted out. So here we go. First of all, I want to discuss uh, a technique for generating an essentially arbitrary collection of random numbers. So we already know how to generate random numbers that are uniformly distributed, say between 0 and 1. And we know if we wanted a distribution between 0 and 5, we could just multiply all those numbers by 5 and we would get such a distribution. If we wanted a distribution between 1 and 8, we could multiply by 7 and add 1, and that would produce such a distribution. So uniform distributions are straightforward. But what if we want a distribution that uh, isn't uniform, but has some sort of a uh, higher density of probability of in one area and a lower de probability density in some other area, such as we find often in quantum mechanics, for example. Um, so here's an example of a distribution. It's called a Lorentzian. I just sort of pulled it out of the air as an example. There are zillions, literally, of different possible distributions you could imagine. Uh, that basically, any mathematical function that you could normalize could be used as a distribution function for random numbers. Um, and I just wanted to uh, give this thing a try. One thing we have to do is to normalize it. So we have to figure out what this number a is. And we can use our favorite uh, linear, or uh, excuse me, uh, symbolic algebra package to do that. And we'll show you here. OK, so here's my favorite um, <coughs> symbolic algebra package. I'm going to define a function. I'll call it f. And uh, what we're going to try to do is see if we can integrate that guy. And the way you spell integration in Sage, this is the open source uh, package that I use sometimes is uh, integrate and I'm going to integrate this function I've defined from minus infinity to infinity and Sage tells me that that's equal to pi over a so I'll go ahead and redefine the function now as the same thing it was before except now I replace the 1 with a over pi that means that when I integrate um, I'll go ahead and tell it to integrate I get 1 so that tells us that uh, indeed the normalization constant is a over pi. And we discover that the proper normalization is a, a over pi, where a is a measure of the width of the distribution, and of course pi is pi. Now, we start with that distribution. The question is, how can I use that to generate random numbers that have that distribution? And in order to accomplish that goal, it's useful to introduce the concept of a cumulative distribution function, which is uh, related to the probability density. It's the integral from minus infinity to x of the probability density. And you can see what it does is it gives you the probability of having a number between negative infinity and x. If you, uh, if you think about it, that means that uh, if the distribution is normalized, you got to get a number between 0 and 1. So let's look at some properties of that guy. So, uh, now that we see that it's normalized, we want to define the cumulative distribution function, which is the integral of f of x from minus infinity to x. Of course, in order to make a function of x, I want to integrate over a different variable, so I'll integrate over z. And let's see what that cdf looks like. Here we go, cdf. It's a mapping of x to the arctangent of x minus b over a, all thing divided by pi plus a half. I could rewrite that, I suppose. Uh, let's see, if I say cdf of x, it comes out looking just like a function. Anyway, I've gone ahead and made in the grapher application a, uh, a function that does that. This is my cumulative distribution function. And here is my uh, original probability density. I've turned a into a thing I can fiddle with. So if I adjust a, you see that affects the the width of the distribution, but uh, I always get a normalized distribution, and the, all that happens to the CDF is that it becomes sharper. If I make a very sharp distribution, the CDF goes from 0 to 1 over a very short range of x. If I, if I make a bigger, it goes from 0 to 1 over a longer range of x. Now, here's the interesting part. What if you imagine uh, generating a random number 
that is uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. So all these random numbers are going to correspond to different heights. And if I use the CDF to map back from that uniform distribution back down to x, so there's a mapping here between x and the CDF, if I run that thing backwards, I invert the CDF, then my uniform distribution of random numbers uh, maps from 0 to 1 all the way back to the x-axis. And in this case, it's x goes from minus infinity to plus infinity because the CDF is defined over that whole range. The interesting thing is dy here, if I think of this as the y direction, dy is equal to the derivative of the CDF times dx, and uh, but the derivative of the CDX is a CDF, excuse me, is the probability density. So if I have a small range of y's here with some probability, I'll have the corresponding range of x's here with the probability equal to the probability density, the derivative of the CDF. So that's why I can invert the CDF and take a random number in the range 0 to 1 and convert it to a random number pulled from my original probability distribution. And what we discover is that if you start with a random number r that's uniformly distributed between 0 and 1, and you take the inverse of the cumulative distribution function of r, that, that the result of that inverse function is distributed as the original probability density p of x. And we can see how that works. Okay, now I have a very simple program. We're going to generate 100 random numbers uh, from 0 to 1, and I'm going to define a and b as I did in the uh, grapher uh, application. If I do this calculation, this is the inversion. The, I'm inverting the cumulative distribution function, and I'm calculating a, a bunch of x's based on these random r's that I calculated up here. And then I'm just going to histogram those guys and show the histogram. So let's run that. And you can see what I get. You know, it looks like some kind of a distribution that's centered around 2, but it's not at all obvious that that's Lorenzian. Let's, uh, let's try bumping the number up a little bit. Let's try 1,000. And that's looking a little better. Let's go ahead and try 10,000. Now we're getting something that's definitely looking Lorenzian. Um, let's try 100,000. Okay, now you can clearly see the curve. And finally, let's just try a million for the fun of it, just because we can. So let me close that, try a million. Uh, I think I can, hang on. Oh, I gotta make that active. There we go, there's a million. And now it's looking quite nice. So uh, you can also see how fast it is. The NumPy number, random number generator is extremely fast and uh, it's extremely good. So we shouldn't have any trouble with that. Now the next technique I'd like to talk about is something called rejection sampling. The idea <coughs> is that you want to generate random numbers according to a probability density P2, and you already know how to generate random numbers according to a probability density P1. Can you use your knowledge of P1 in order to generate P2? And the idea, of course, P2 in this graph uh, is meant to go to zero, at uh, 1.5 and 2.5, uh, I just couldn't easily get it to not go below zero with straight lines, and so just ignore the parts that go below zero. P2 is zero up to 1.5, and then it's a linearly increasing function, then it's a linearly decreasing function, then it's zero from 2.5 on. So that's the intent there. <coughs> how could I generate that distribution if I know how to generate the distribution P1? The idea is, you pick a random x according to the distribution p1, and then you reject it or accept it depending on the value of the ratio of p2 to p1. So obviously, because of the way we've cooked up p2, it's, it's always less than p1 everywhere. It's not normalized, but it's a function that's less than p1 everywhere. And so if I accept the x value with the probability that's equal to the ratio of p2 to p1, you'll notice that what I'm doing is throwing away some of the x's from the p1 distribution in such a way that the x's that I accept 
will automatically have the distribution P2. That's the idea. So you accept X sub I with the probability equal to P2 divided by P1. And that's and you reject the other one, since that's, that's why it's called the rejection sampling scheme. Let's uh, get a demo of how that's going to work. So this is the rejection method, and uh, here we have the P1 probability and the P2 probability, which you'll recognize. Here's the Lorentz generator encapsulated as a function. Here I have a list of results that I'm collecting, and, uh, and then the idea is I first generate x random numbers according to the Lorentz distribution. Then I compute the ratio p2 to p1, and I keep those where a random number is less than that ratio, a uniformly distributed random number between 0 and 1. If it's less than that ratio, I keep them. If, uh, if it's not less than that ratio, I just ignore those guys. And then I'm, I'm going to calculate here the first time through, I'm going to calculate the fraction of the numbers that I accept. And I'm going to use that to predict how many new numbers I need to generate in order to produce the number that I want. So I add the uh, new x's to my list of results. Then I generate a new n, which is the number I need to request in order to get the number that I want. And notice, I take the difference between the number that I want and the number that I have divided by the acceptance fraction, which means, let's say I got 70% the first time, if I divide that by 0.7, then uh, that'll give me a big enough number that I should get it in the next go. So hopefully this only runs once or, or twice at the most. Uh, maybe occasionally it might run three times, but uh, most of the time you'll get it in two two shots. And uh, and then I just make a histogram of the, of the results. So let's try that. I'm only ask for 100 and uh, let's see what we get and we get something you can see it's sort of distributed between 1.5 and 2.5 but it's not looking terribly triangular let's try with a thousand and this time it's getting more triangular how about 10,000 now we're getting a decidedly triangular sort of look let's try a hundred thousand now with 100,000 numbers, you can definitely see that triangular nature there. So it's clearly working. We'll go up to a million just for grins. And there you have it, a million random numbers distributed uh, with this triangle shape. Fascinating. Very good. So next is the Metropolis algorithm. I had incorrectly labeled the rejection sampling Metropolis algorithm before. I apologize. The Metropolis algorithm is slightly different, although it's slightly similar. And because of the similarities, I had mixed it up in my head. And uh, But now I've got it all straight. Uh, if you start with any distribution of x's, and then you give them a little bump. So you just give them a little random kick, move them around a little bit. And then if the new probability, if the probability of one of the bumped x's is greater than the old probability, in other words, you take the probability density function you want to produce and you compare the probability at the new x to the probability at the old x. If it goes up, you accept it unconditionally. Now obviously if you've got a thousand x's and you bump all thousand of them, some of them are going to go up in probability, some of them are going to go down. The ones that go up, you take. The ones that go down, you accept with a probability equal to the ratio of the new to the old. Now, you only do this for the ones where p new is less than p old, so this probability will definitely be less than 1, which is good for a probability. And so it turns out you'll reject the ones where the new probability goes down a lot. But if the new probability only goes down a little bit, you'll generally accept those guys. And so, and you can prove, which I'm not going to prove because I don't have time for that, but you can prove that if you do that for a long period of time, that on the average, the x's will distribute themselves according to the probability distribution that you wish to produce. So we'll get a little demo of how that works. Okay, so here's the Metropolis algorithm. Um, here's the basic idea. We start with a certain number of random numbers and we're gonna iterate this many times. This is the size of the bump when I bump them on each time step. 
I still have my the parameters of my desired probability distribution, but now I, I no longer have any other probability distribution, just the one I'm interested in. And here's the function that shakes the numbers up. You just add a Gaussian with a width of delta, and uh, that shakes them around. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to keep track of the acceptance ratios, the fraction that I accept. I'm going to start with a uniform distribution uh, between um, b minus a half a and b plus a half a, roughly. Uh, and no, I'm sorry, b minus a and b plus a, just a little tiny bit less than b minus a to b plus a. And uh, I can evaluate the probability at the current x's just by applying x to the function. And uh, I'm going to make a histogram of where everybody is. And uh, here are these two guys. I can either display the histogram every step, or I can accumulate the histogram every step, or I can just wait till the end and accumulate it at the end. So if these are both zero, I just wait till the end. Otherwise, I'm displaying the particle histogram on every step. Here I display the accumulated particle histogram on every step. And uh, basically, this just executes the Metropolis algorithm. You um, shake up the x's, you crack calculate the probability at the new x's, you take the ratio of the new probability with the old probability. If that ratio is greater than 1, you definitely accept it. If it's not greater than 1, you accept it conditionally. And uh, the condition is that the ratio is less than um, a random number. So here, or here's the ratio. You check to see if a random number is less than that ratio. Sorry, I had it backwards. You check to see if the random number is less than the ratio. If it is, you accept. If it isn't, you reject. And that means that if the probability goes down just a little bit, chances are you'll accept it. But if it goes down a lot, you probably won't accept it. And then you just iterate that over and over again. And that's all this code does. Um, you can display it every step, display accumulated over the entire run or you can just wait till the end that's what these guys do so the details aren't that critical at this moment i just want you to understand the idea so let's go ahead and run it i'm gonna at the moment i have this thing set up to show the histogram every step so i'll get this out of the way and we can watch it notice it started out as a uh, uniform distribution and you can see that random numbers are bouncing around and they look like they could very well be uh, semi-triangular um, but let's uh, let's bump the numbers up a little bit. Let's go to 10,000 particles. And you can see now it's looking much more triangular. But um, still, you can see there's a lot of variability in there. And uh, it's hard to tell if the average really works out to be triangular exactly. So um, let's see what happens if I show the accumulated histogram. In other words, now every time step we're going to add the histograms together and you can see what happens to the overall histogram. Notice the scale is getting bigger now because we keep adding the histograms together. But look at what's happening to the sides of our distribution. It's, it's uh, straightening out nicely. And uh, let's bump up the number of iterations a little bit. We'll go to 100,000 particles and let's go for like a thousand iterations uh, and see what happens. Now you can really see the thing um, becoming triangular. So that's how that works. Let's go ahead and change it so that it just shows us, goes ahead and accumulates over all time. Just shows, show us the answer. Don't bother us with the uh, animation in the middle and we'll see what happens hopefully this won't take too long there we go okay beautiful and uh, also this way we get to see the acceptance ratio and notice that the acceptance ratio is uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 percent a little more than 70 percent so you get the idea that uh, most of the time we accept all right and that's how it works. Finally, I just want to introduce you to the concept of quantum Monte Carlo, diffusion quantum Monte Carlo. It's just a trick, basically, that enables you to use Monte Carlo techniques 
to estimate quantum wave functions. Uh, generally, quantum wave functions of ground states, but it is possible through various tricks to do excited states as well. But let's just discuss the concept. If you take the time variable in the Schrodinger wave equation and you make it imaginary, the Schrodinger wave equation is suddenly transformed into a real differential equation. It happens to be exactly the diffusion equation. You can use Monte Carlo techniques to solve the diffusion equation by simulating the diffusion process. And in the end, the uh, density of the diffusing particles in the diffusion equation turns out to take a shape that's exactly the solution to the diffusion equation. And of course, if the Schrodinger wave equation is written in such a way that its solutions become solutions to the diffusion equation, then you can generate solutions to the Schrodinger wave equation by solving the diffusion equation using the Monte Carlo technique. That's the idea. And that's the whole show. I hope, uh, I hope it was somewhat useful, and uh, we'll see you guys next time.